when I used to, I used to, I don't, I didn't actually listen to everything you said, Dan, I'm sorry. But uh, when I taught here as the art history professor at the uh, department, I had a lot of students continually ask this one singular question, which is, oh, sorry, I'm just short. That's why. <laughs> it doesn't, you know, come to me. I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> Can you hear me now? OK, so when I was, used to teach here, in the uh, department, one of the biggest questions I got was, um, how can I be a Christian contemporary artist? And I thought, this is a very strange question, because what, what do you, am I even, how do you even say that? Oh, I'm, hi, nice to meet you. I'm a contemporary artist of faith. I'm, a, I'm an artist who's a Christian. I'm, I'm a Christian artist who practices contemporary art. What do you say? It's kind of an odd thing. None of us actually go out there in the world saying, hi, my name is Christina Valentine. I'm Korean-American contemporary theorist. I, it just doesn't work. <laughs> so given that, I thought, you know, there's an underside to this question, this question about Christian identity and contemporary culture. And I think that is, what exactly are we talking about when we say religious art? Is there really something called religious art? So to that end, I want to show you couple of images. Oh, so before I get there, good thing I have this. Um, I want to say the term religious art seems to be a prescribed idea to help categorize images. Today, the term usually refers to the body of Renaissance art and, so, you know, proto-Renaissance and some earlier that deals with religious content and artwork that has a Christian theme, idea, or symbol. And I think today, as you can see by um, Elkins's presentation, it is still religious art, when we say religious art, we think, oh, artwork that has Christian themes, ideas, or symbols, specifically, I think, for this audience. Um, and also, really, in the broader context of America and the United States, we have a very overriding Judeo-Christian influence. And so, when people say the word religious art, you don't think Buddhists, you know. Most often, it seems that people think Jesus, Mary, God, cherubs, things like that. And, what I'd like to think about, I know for me, when I think about religion, or when I think about that practice of faith, what I think is work that can engage the viewer to thoughtfully contemplate and think about God and their relationship or understanding of their life in relationship to God. And I think those words really fail that, that kind of uh, profundity when you get to the point of like taking a faith. But that, that moment, maybe we can call it an epiphany. It seems to me a better description of what art can do that can be you know, thought of in terms of this word religion. So as a guideline for this discussion, I'd like to focus on three points, content and context, three basic questions when experiencing a work of art, and the relationship between the work itself and how it affects the viewer. But first, let's talk about religious art. Um, most common identifiers are really relig religious art. If you went to some, somebody out there, you know, just on the walk here at this campus, if you said, what is religious art? Who, who do you think of? They'll say probably Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael. As you can see, the idea, these, uh, the big hitters, who you know, we also know as the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they not only has their names, but the artworks that they have you know, put out there that are historic in terms of how we see religion has changed a lot. Um, looking at the ways in which their work has manifested in the current popular culture, it's obvious that religion is not intrinsic to the object. These works have been multiplied into kitsch culture, as well as being considered as historic art objects that form the lineage of art practice. And um, I mean, it's not even here, as you can see by Mr. Elkins' uh, presentation, you were laughing a lot when he talked about religious art, and he showed you what he considered as religious art. Well, that laughter doesn't escape me because you understand the irony and the kitschy factor in a lot of those works that you yourselves, I'm sure, have been bombarded by growing up in a Christian community. For those of you out there who are um, within that practice. Um, 
But the context in part, okay, oh. It seems to me, yeah, so we, we tend to privilege content, but the context, in part with the content, seems to make the object religious. Let's look at Our Lady of Angels, a cathedral built in our time by a Pritzker winning um, architect. The architecture and objects that make up the idea of the cathedral are singularly religious in a matter of style. It is the context that has given the building and the objects in the building their meaning and intended experience. Um, I don't know about you, but my church doesn't look like this. So, but you know, but you see the cross and you say, oh, that, that's a church. There's a signifier for me that I can go into and say, oh, that is a church. If that wasn't there, what would you think? It's, it is a postmodern architecture and around the corner you have Disney Hall. So in terms of the layout, it tends to stay within the theme of postmodern architecture in its setting. However, you, you know, most of us in Los Angeles know this is Our Lady of Angels. And we also know that this is a Catholic church. Um, oops. And some of the artists who were commissioned to do work there, Robert Graham. This is the, um, the focal sculpture into the entryway of the cathedral. He's also considered, I mean, he's a contemporary artist who I believe he, oh, I forget where he shows at, but it escaped me at the moment, but he's, you know, he, his affairs are star-studded, to say the least, right? So what do, we see, what do you see here, and what do you see here? What are we looking at? Is it the same? Is it the same sculpture? Is it the same artist? Is his practice any different? What is different is, I think, to say the least, is the context of the situation and, and a larger scope. If the object is placed in the gallery setting, the meaning changes as it reverberates the, with a now, you know, is, I think, defined narrative of the modernist cube. Obviously, when the modernist cube was developed at first, it was the idea that we want to strip away any kind of narrative of meaning. But if you think about it throughout history, the layering of past exhibitions have given it that the modern space meaning inadvertently or perhaps purposefully by artists. So you read this differently than you would this. But it's by the one and the same artist. And I don't, he doesn't hide this. He doesn't say in his uh, website that his uh, sculpture of Our Lady is a separate kind of project completely outside of his uh, sculptural practice. So <laughs> the other person too is uh, Lita, Lita Albuquerque. She did the Plaza Fountain there. And I have to say that none of these people, you know, I'm. As I think as a matter of, of uh, my purpose for my lecture, I'm not going to tell you if they're believers or not. Do we necessarily need to know that? Does that in any way ratify or validate their practice and the object that they make for a certain setting? I'm not quite sure that it does. I know for myself, being a, a Korean, uh, I can go into a situation that is where I am surrounded by Koreans. That doesn't necessarily make me uh, one of them, let's say, even though I look like them, and vice versa. You know, if there's, we have a lot of disparity, there's a lot of contingency in all of us. And so to uh, identify or try to navigate our world with these kind of uh, terms tends to limit the experience. Okay, so, so I did that, okay. <clears throat> Okay, given that the objects seem unable to stay within a fixed point, such as the term religious art, as noted by the previous you know, images of, of the master's paintings, I would venture to say that the idea of religious art is a myth. I'm not saying, please note here, I'm not saying religion is a myth. I'm just saying that the idea of religious art is a myth. If we think about myth as an idea or a tradition that over the you know, course of time takes on a grander kind of overarching narrative, I think that's what's happened to this, this word, religious art. We've made it into this kind of banner under which we can go into, but why? Why, go, why do we have to go there? I don't necessarily, as a person of color, or you know, minority status, let's say, I don't, I don't go under the heading of Asian American. Um, it doesn't really serve me any purpose other than narrowing my condition of who I am. 
So, and not to mention the name, last name Valentine is very confusing to a lot of people. They think that I'm Italian, actually, before they meet me. So there's a lot of interesting kind of gaps that can be got at, and I think that we tend to narrow and, and uh, ghettoize in some ways ourselves in these kinds of terminologies. So, I, okay, so, okay, so let me go back to my little talk here. It says, given that the objects seem to stay unable to stay, okay, unable to stay within a fixed point, such as the term religious art, I would venture to say religious art is a myth. The term privileges a specific set of symbols, Jesus, Mary, angels, God, images. These symbols have become tropes for us and have come to mean more beyond the idea of God incarnate. And I would prove that by the fact that you guys can laugh. You can laugh at what I show you because they are tropes and you see them that way. If you thought that they were, that these images of these renderings of Jesus, God, and Mary were holy and sacrosanct unto themselves, I would have heard gasps, possibly people running out of the, you know, running out screaming, because it would have been less, really, it would have been a horrific kind of an idea of to desecrate the image that you consider truly holy. And as I think we live in a time where these images have been played out so, so much that that picture of Jesus doesn't really hold water in terms of what we, what we practice daily in you know, what you consider as your faith. So all of which has, this is to say that all of this has become layered with so much subtext. It's like trying to listen in on too much static. If we agree that there's this kind of interference in the content of religious art, how can the ideas behind the content be experienced in such a way as if for the first time? And I don't know about you, but I hear a lot of people in my own Christian community who'll say, oh, remember, remember when you first believed in God? Do you remember that? Oh, I miss that. I really, I really wish I could have that again. And I wonder, what are they really talking about? What is that thing that they're talking about? It's this, it, is it is that we can say an epiphany moment. Can we have that again? How do we have that again? And I would venture to say you can't have that in art. I know if, if I couldn't, I wouldn't be invested in this practice that I am. Now, to get at that though, we need to look at three basic questions about art. What is it? Why make it? How is it done? And here I want you to, um, we're going to look at two videos, just one moment though. In considering and experiencing a work of art, there are these three basic questions. And most often the two first questions are emphasized in terms of criticism. I would like to propose a special importance to the question of how. The question is one that considers the affect of the artwork. The question is significant because the moment of one's failure to answer it marks the success of an artwork. Did you ever have that moment when you were at a loss for words after an art, some kind of an experience? Oh, I, it was amazing, I can't describe it. That movie, I don't, I don't know why, I don't know why it made me feel that way. That would be the inability to answer the how question. In art, it is that indefinable thing that imbues the artwork with personal significance for the viewer. It is a practice, but the moment of not being able to explain it is magic, or in the case of this audience, perhaps miraculous. So, in viewing these two works, let's please consider the how. The first one is Adrian Pachi, the weeper, and his gallery told me to promise that I would say courtesy of Peter Blum Gallery, so just so you know. And the second is Bastian Otter.
the lament is, what is this lament this morning of a mother weeping her only son? Poor woman, what happened to you? How can I cry for so young a man who died in a foreign land? Oh, Adrian Pachi, young man. And the work, the piece itself was um, done by an Albanian artist, or well, actually he's not really, he's Albanian by being born there, but then he ends up in Italy. Like I said, you know, we have these complexities of identities. And the piece is a part, it's, it plays into the tradition in Albania where when someone dies, the people are invited to come and mourn at the funeral rite. And um, it's been practiced that during the, the mourners would be so moved that the men would traditionally groan and scratch themselves and sway back and forth to the point that they would bleed. And the women would lament, but they would not scratch themselves. And the scratching got out of hand, and the participants at these rites were streaming with blood. So the Catholic Church banned the custom about 60 years ago under the threat of severe punishment, maintaining that such despair ran counter to the belief of resurrection. So just keep that in mind, and now we're going to, can we? Are you going to? Okay. Now we're going to see um, Bastian Otter. I'm too sad to tell you. So in the first video, The Weeper, Pachi stages his own death by hiring a professional weeper to grieve his passing. In some ways, isn't that something we all want to do, is be there at our own funeral to see who comes and see what they say? And he actually got to do it. Um, obviously, you can see, it, yes, it is, it is very much a postmodern art piece. He is not dead. He plays dead. He gets up. He's, in some ways, the postmodern Lazarus, I guess you can say. Um, 
and and al and then also as well, there is that political um, content involved, where he by his the gesture of doing this, it is a criticism of the Catholic Church, specifically within his, the country that of his origin. So why do I show this to you? Well, I show you these two works specifically because I personally found them to be very moving. I, I, I love Pachi's work because it's funny, but it's also sincere. He is really contending with that moment when we die. What would it be like for you to lie down on your crypt? What would it be like if you actually went and got a coffin and laid in it and had a funeral? What would go through your mind? What would you be thinking of? That, for me as a viewer, is something I contend with. And also, this woman, the mourner, you know, does the mourner have emotion there? What kind of emotion should she have to summon this uh, dirge that she sings for him, a complete stranger? And how would it feel to have a, poor, a person mourn for you? There's something in these two works that I found very interesting, is that they both contend with something that we are all familiar with tears, crying, death. And I think for Pachi, the work disrupts our, I think, common expectations of what death would be. Especially, I think here, it's, you know, today's the eyes of March, isn't that kind of funny? And we're almost upon Easter, and I have to say, I don't know about you, but it came awfully fast and I kind of almost forgot. And I think, you know, why does that happen? Why do these things slip from my memory? Is it because they're not significant to me? No, it's because, you know, in the daily mundane, like the banality of life that we lead day to day, you tend to forget the significant. And I think someone like Pachi's work, it makes you stop and pay attention. It makes you laugh, it makes you consider. And possibly, if you're lucky, you get that moment of epiphany for yourself. Now, with uh, Bastian Otter's work, I don't know if you're all familiar with him. I'm, I would like to assume so, because he is such a, a critical player in terms of conceptual art. But um, he had a very short career, lasting five years in the mid-70s. And he actually died uh, doing the second part of a three-part project called In Search of the Miraculous. And that second part involved him going on a very, very small sailboat, I think it was 12 foot and some inches, crossing the Atlantic and ending up in, landing in, um, oh, I forget, in England. But anyway, um, in doing this, he, the radio contact was lost and he disappeared. He didn't, you know, no one knew what happened. And I think about a year or so later, his um, boat was found off the coast of Ireland, but his body was never found. And then that boat eventually was lost or stolen. And in, there is this blurring between his life and his practice in this way. And it's very hard for writers to not write about that, that ending of, you know, that's such, such a romantic ending to a career that was rife with playing on sentimentality within a conceptual framework. If you look up, if, you know, look, think about that Bastian Arter piece. You, um, you see a person crying. You see it in the framework of a Hollywood, you know, close up of the person crying, that moment, you know, in a, in a Hollywood narrative. But there's no sound and all you see is him crying. We don't know why. And I think as an artist, you would think that he is contriving this experience. But at the same time, let us consider, how does one contrive to cry? Can you, how do you fake it? How do you fake that crying? What do you have to think about? What is the process you have to undergo? And in some respects, there is that, what, how is this done? What is the artist doing to himself to get there that is so compelling? And it makes you question the, that, that disconnect or the balance or whatever you want to call it, the relationship between the artificial and the real in this instance, because he gets at the real through the artifice of forcing himself. So, um, I just want to show you those two works specifically because it is moving to me and I think there are moments that it can have these epiphanies. And Okay, so I have to wrap it up before my microphone disappears like the Oscars. I have to tell you, this is my conclusion. You know, I've, I find it odd that in this moment where we've had major exhibitions on themes such as post-black, post-feminist, post-postmodern, 
we were capitulating to valorize artworks solely for their spiritual content. It seems to me that it sounds like another means of ghettoizing the discussion of faith and spirituality into a corner outside the larger discussion of art and specifically contemporary art and that illusion in, of its, in itself that makes it so universal. Um, I've, ha I've heard the kind of uh, problematic question that Mr. Elkins here raises. But rather than the Christian identity, I've heard it under the guide, the framework of the Asian, Latino, black, gay, um, what have you, identity. And I, I think it's a bit troubling because if, if we truly are gonna buy into any kind of like post anything, then what, why do we have to legitimate ourselves? And why do you have to say you're, you're this or that but not the other? It seems like if you are one person and it's all in you, what comes out of you is either going to be good art or bad art. And that's really going to be the end of it to that extent. Thank you.